This afternoon, we're going to talk about a serious public health issue. The rising number of people dying from drug overdoses. Je sais beaucoup d'entre nous au sein de l'Alliance pour des communautés en santé sont témoins des répercussions dévastatrices de cette crise sur les personnes et les communautés que nous servons. De nombreux membres ont exercé une leadership résolue et travaillant à l'avant-garde pour sauver des vies grâce à des programmes efficaces de réduction des méfaits. We know this affects all communities. We know there is no one solution that fits all communities. So how do we build local support for harm reduction? How do we find the right strategies for our individual communities? During this afternoon's plenary session, we're going to hear from four experienced people who are working on this issue from different angles, from the board level, from the front lines, in an urban and in a rural community. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Rob Boyd to introduce the plenary speakers, but first I get to introduce him. Rob has been working with youth and young and adults for, with mental health and substance issues in Ottawa for 25 years, including the last 14 years as the director of the OASIS program at the Sandy Hill Community Health Center. OASIS is a leader in integrating mental health, substance use, and primary care services for people who experience barriers accessing mainstream services. Please join me in welcoming Rob. Good morning, or sorry, good afternoon. As I'm pleased to be here uh, to be able to talk about how we can best respond to the overdose crises in our communities here in Ontario. Uh, so I'm going to start by introducing uh, three colleagues who are also going to have an opportunity to come to the uh, mic to address you from their perspectives, and then we will have uh, provide ample time to open up the floor for questions so you have an opportunity to uh, ask us about uh, some of our experience. So uh, first of all, uh, right across from, my, from the left to right, it's uh, Frank Critchlow. He has been a harm reduction worker for 12 years with the Counterfeit harm reduction program at South Riverdale Community Health Centre in Toronto, uh, where he provides harm reduction education, uh, referrals and distribution. He's a member of the Drug Policy Committee of the Toronto Drug Strategy at Toronto Public Health, and he is the chair of the Toronto Drug Users Union. Uh, he volunteers at the Moss Park Overdose Prevention Site. Steve Goodine is the board chair of the London Intercommunity Health Center er, uh, and co-director of the Center for Research on Health Equity and Social Inclusion at Western University. Uh, Steve was a London Police Services Officer for 30 years and, reti and retired in 2016. Jackie Harris is a primary care manager at Central Community Health Center in St. Thomas and co-chair of the Elgin Situation Table. She's a registered nurse who has worked in emergency rooms in the Mississippi, Detroit, London, and St. Thomas areas. Uh, she was the lead at the Elgin Street St. Thomas Public Health Unit for the area's needle exchange program. And uh, Jackie also uh, works at the overdose prevention site in London as well. So, or, so pardon me, in London, yes, in London. So how to start and how to talk about this issue now. The numbers are grim. 2017, in Ontario, there are two, uh, 1,262 opioid overdose deaths. This was a 50% increase over 2016. Fentanyl was detected in 60% of opioid overdose deaths in 2017, which was a 100% increase over the year before. The crisis is escalating and we're only at the beginning. We're also poised at a critical moment. Uh, we are facing a drug safety crisis like the likes of which has never been seen in the world. We have a toxic supply of drugs that are out there in the unregulated market that are increasing the harms associated uh, with the use of opioids both 
uh, dependently and recreationally. And the solution is really simple. We really need to always name what the solution is. We have to properly name what the problem is as well. We're, we're not in the midst of an opiate crisis. We're in the midst of a drug policy crisis. What we need to do is we need to legalize and regulate access to all drugs in Canada. And we need to ensure... <laughs> and we need to ensure that people who are dependent on opioids have access to a safe supply. Today we're talking about harm reduction and it's really critical that we understand that harm reduction isn't about preventing the harms from drug use, it's about preventing the harms of drug policy. And most of what we're doing is a workaround for drug policy. Uh, and this means more than just changing the laws around, uh, around drugs because prohibition kind of creeps into all sorts of different areas of our thinking. Uh, so this also uh, means you know, the, the government's announcing uh, you know, new funding for addictions and mental health uh, treatment services. We need to make sure that these services are evidence-based and we know that abstinence-only treatment are, is a form of prohibition. Uh, forced opioid tapering is a form of prohibition. So we have to be uh, very vigilant about how prohibition creeps into other aspects of how we think about drugs and drug use. And these are deadly practices that are contributing to the escalating crisis. There's an air of dread uncertainty in harm reduction in Ontario right now. We're, the gains that we have made over the past few years have been significant. It's quite remarkable uh, to think about how far we've come in a short period of time in terms of mainstreaming harm reduction and, and providing general acceptance in the, in the population of what good evidence-based uh, care for people who use drugs is. Uh, but this is, this is under threat. We need, to, we need to be wary of this. This battle is starting all over again. We felt like we just finished it. And uh, unfortunately, the timing of this couldn't be worse uh, with the escalating number of overdoses that are happening and the fact that we, we don't have really good established systems in place uh, to, uh, to mitigate the harms that are coming uh, to Ontarians right now. So what can we do? What can we do going forward right now? So we, 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 we're now at a point where we're often thinking of because of the crisis, uh, let's talk about uh, supervised consumption sites and things like that. But there's lots of other things that are part of harm reduction uh, that I think that as CHCs, uh, we, if, you, if you're not already doing it, you want to be thinking about doing it, you want to get, uh, get, get action on, on it. So you know, what are other things that you can do? Are you currently distributing take-home naloxone kits? Are you currently distributing uh, needles and pipes? Are you currently uh, providing uh, buprenorphine, naloxone, or, or uh, um, uh, suboxone treatment within your agency. There, there are, there's a role for CHCs in this, despite uh, what government is in place. There are opportunities that for, for movement that, that you can uh, start addressing right away as you, uh, as you think about how you are getting involved in the crisis. I think about those old war uh, promotion calendars, you know, what did you do during the war, Daddy? You know, those, those, those posters that were out? I think that people are going to ask us, what did you do during the drug war? What did you do to resist what was clearly a, a violation of people's rights and, a, and, a, and, and the, that was really geared towards actually, uh, uh, you know, k literally killing people in terms of drug policy uh, based on uh, propaganda and misinformation. Do you have uh, client-driven opioid tapering practices within your, uh, within your CHC? And then, of course, what about SIS and overdose prevention sites? Pardon me, supervised injection services or consumption services and overdose prevention sites. Don't wait. Just because we don't think that this government is going to be supportive of it, there's no reason not to get active and in, involved in conversations about uh, supervised injection services or overdose prevention sites in your community. Those conversations in and of themselves provide a tremendous uh, opportunity for education of your local community uh, about the needs and the crisis that's going on. And that can definitely shift the ground in terms of political, uh, politi political opinion. Resist and get creative. Last year, uh, when I was up talking on one of these panels, I talked about microsites. You know, we, know we need to stop thinking about large, large sites and services. Let's start thinking about something a little bit smaller. What can you do in your CHC with your existing resources to support uh, supervised consumption of, of drugs in your facility? Uh, what can we do with the access to uh, take-home naloxone programs to support peer-led uh, supervised injection or overdose prevention activities? We have to really start thinking 
uh, about how we're going to provide resistance within this new political co context that we're working in. How do we have these conversations? Wh what's important when we're talking to our, to our communities about this? It's really important to, to, to keep it focused on health. This is a healthcare issue. We did not get involved in this issue to become political. We got involved in this issue because it was providing good health care for people that were within our mandate. That's why we got involved. The politics was something that just came along with it. Uh, this is a crisis. We have to keep telling people and keep reminding people this is a crisis and it's going to get worse. And the policies that are being and uh, that are likely to be enacted, or a lot of the policies that are currently in enacted, are policies that are contributing and amplifying the harm to people. We need to give our community. We need to invite people into the conversation. We need to to be able to, to talk to people in a way that they're not going to feel judged. Uh, people not, people have grown up with drug war propaganda all their lives. It's a natural attitude that people have that drugs are bad and therefore people who use them you know should know better and things like that. We that that's a lot of swimming upstream we have to do. But we have to have that education. We have to invite people in. We have to allow them to express the things that they need to express in a non-judgmental way. And then we need to give them correct information and wait. And we don't have to convince everybody no, you know and everybody doesn't have to get on board but our experience is that when you do that in a respectful way you bring people into the conversation that in fact uh, people by and large do get it you got to think in the short term and in the long term you got to think about uh, you know what you can do today and you got to also have the long game in mind I mean it took us seven years to get supervised injection services uh, going in our center that's sometimes that's how long ahead you got to think when, you, when you're involved in doing social change of, of this scale, uh, there's three things you have to have as, as you, in your toolkit. You have to have facts, you have to have empathy, and you have to have perseverance. Thank you. Today, I've been asked to comment on the values and necessity of involving people who use drugs in harm reduction and other programs that serve, that services meant to serve this group. People who use drugs have been taking care of each other for decades. We have been doing this work since before we had offices, funding, and programs. We are the experts, and we are the ones who have educated the healthcare professions, researchers, and, and policy makers. A person with lived experience of drug use has, has more expertise than you could ever imagine or you can ever learn from a book. What writers, uh, what writers of textbooks are writing is what we tell them in a different language. When they make policies for us, without us, the effect, it doesn't work the same. It's often wrong. The language is hard to interpret. Having people with lived experience in the design and delivery of service role, service is key because we understand each other, both in terms of language and empathy. It also keeps programs real and committed to true harm reduction values and practices. Many places only give lip service to harm reduction. Secretly or not so secretly, abstinence as a goal. Because drugs are criminalized, there is a deep stigma and discrimination against people who use drugs. Having drug users employed in programs enhances trust with clients. It shows that drug users are valued in your agency. This is critical because so many people who use drugs are treated very poorly by the health and social service system, especially women and racialized people. The stigma around drug use in the black community is very high. 
especially for women who have kids. There are concerns about the Children's Aid Society, and many feel like it's a disgrace to their fa family and friends. Strong feelings of pride prevent people from accessing harm reduction services because they are rightly afraid of being criminalized and, and or unjustly targeted by the so-called service providers. Having people with lived experience in service delivery roles help to remove some of the stigma and stereotyping within the African Canadian black community and demonstrate that people who use drugs will have a safe space. Trust, trust takes time and it's an ongoing process for all groups who we as a society oppress through our policy choices and stigmatization. For example, even our established harm reduction clients at South Riverdale, we still had to build trust again for the new supervised consumption site so we could, so they would feel comfortable with being able to use openly and without fear of judgment or arrest. The safe injection site, staff with lived experience of drug use were key to making people feel comfortable. Harm reduction meets people where they are at and values community expertise and knowledge. Harm reduction doesn't simply mean service provision. It also means ensuring voices of current and former people who use drugs are heard and are front and central when the government makes public policy. As part of that work, I'm a board member for the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs for the Ontario Region. CAPUD is a national drug users union focused on increasing the human rights of people who use drugs. We are activists, first and foremost, fighting for our lives during an overdose epidemic. We rallies, we use rallies and political demonstration to ensure our voice is heard. Our board of directors is made up of current and former people who use drugs. Caput has grown over the years by being attentive to issues raised by our membership. When we started this work, Caput had no input into policy decisions made by the federal government that impacted us. As a result, drug policies were made in our exclusion and the, res and the results were deadly. For example, take the Oxycontin reformulation. Removing this drug without any thought for people who are using it led many more to use heroin and fentanyl. As a result, overdose deaths have increased staggeringly. This is why Kaput advocates for public policy that is made in our voices and is focused on ending the war on drugs. Despite the discouraging fact that we had no say in the government decision when we started this work, we continue to press the federal government to hear our voices. Later, last year, Kaput co-sponsored a National Day of Action on the overdose epidemic. In eight cities, people who use drugs and harm reduction workers took to the streets to public demonstration focused on the federal political change we all agree was important. Number one, decriminalization of all drugs. Number two, injectable opiate-assisted treatment. Number three, 
harm reduction and overdose prevention in the Canadian federal prisons. No, number four, immediate exemption for all supervised consumption sites. And number five, funding for drug users organizations. From that day forward, we continue to pressure the government to recognize us as a primary stakeholder in the Canadian drug policy. This included This included a powerful demonstration at the, in, at the International Harm Reduction Conference in Montreal last year when the, when the Federal Minister Jane Philpott spoke. While she was talking, we turned our backs at the opening of the conference. Caput continues to be in, influential in the Canadian drug policy. Following the example of the Toronto Overdose Prevention Society, we created a guidebook that people can use to start their own overdose prevention site in communities. This guidebook was used to open the Ottawa Overdose Prevention Site as well. Caput has made several progress in getting our voice heard. Last November, we hosted uh, the first ever round table between people who use drugs from across Canada and the federal government. In attendance were, were Canada's federal health minister, the chief public health officer of Canada, and the assistant deputy minister responsible for the overdose at the federal level. Our, our efforts paid off, and now Caput is a federally funded National Drug Users Union. <laughs> Before the federal government would likely question why we need to be involved in decision making. Caput has been, in, has been influential in efforts to expand access to safer opiate drug, including injectable opiate assist, assisted treatment in British Columbia. In all its advocacy, Cupid work, works to ensure principles of harm reductions are upheld. Because of the bravery and commitment of groups like the Toronto Overdose Prevention Society, progress has been made across the province. Overdose prevention sites have opened in cities like London and Hamilton, but it's being treated by forces that put the pol um, politics ahead of human lives. The election of Doug Ford and the PCs threatened the lives of many people across the province at the risk of overdose. It couldn't have happened at the worst time for us, with over 1,200 dead in Ontario last year. It is likely even more people will die needlessly this year. There are many lives at stake, and the street drug supply is increasingly dangerous. Now, perhaps more than ever in this province, lives of people who use drugs are being are used as political soapbox for misguided politicians. When the drug supply is poison, harm reduction is a human right. In closing, <laughs> in closing, would you ever design a service for a policy for women without consulting women? Would you? The same principle should apply to people who use drugs. Nothing for us without us. This is a harm reduction principle, which is critical in developing and delivering harm reduction programs and services. Harm reduction found me 
and now I am able to support others as a harm reduction worker in an environment that respects, trusts, and supports who I am and what I do as I reach out to service users every day because I've been there. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Frank and I were talking at lunch and I just said what a, an honor and privilege it was to share the, the stage with him and he said, I didn't think I'd be sharing the stage with a retired police officer. <laughs> but thank, thank you, Frank. <laughs> and talking about drugs, that was the other piece. So I'm here to, uh, to speak to you about the, uh, the London experience, uh, both as a, as a board member and, uh, and as a police officer, retired police officer. Uh, so learning about the effects of trauma and violence in uh, young men uh, is something that happened early in my policing career. I was an investigator assigned to Project Guardian, which was an investigation into the sexual exploitation of children, mainly boys and young men. Uh, these vulnerable boys coped with their trauma by using drugs and alcohol and presented antisocial and criminal behaviors. I realized we were chasing the wrong people. We needed a better strategy to address the vulnerabilities of these kids, which were the social determinants of health. That was 1995. So move into 2016, uh, the Middlesex London Health Unit identified an increase in HIV and Hep C infections in London, along with uh, corresponding overdoses and overdose deaths. This started a broad community conversation of, uh, of drug use and community health and London needed a coordinated plan to address this health crisis. So the medical officer of health, Dr. Chris Mackey, took the lead and requested a community study and the results supported supervised consumption services. So the community planning group was created and the original four members were Dr. Mackey, Brian Lester, who is the uh, executive director of the regional HIV AIDS connection, Scott Cordes, the ED of the London Inner Community Health Center, our ED, and the Chief of Police uh, for the London Police Service, John Perry. So let me repeat that. The Chief of Police was part of the original planning group. So it's important to understand how that happened. Uh, retired Deputy Chief Ian Peer was a champion of harm reduction and mental health during his career in policing. He was the board chair of uh, the Intercommunity Health Centre and he recruited me to the board as he believed it was critical to have a police officer connected with the health center as he was leaving the board. So between Ian and I, we have uh, 16 years of consecutive membership on the health center board. So although other police officers were assigned to strategic tables, uh, having a police officer in a governance role was important as it gives a different perspective uh, to this health crisis. So Chief John Perry was always open to updates from me and he was prepared when the community asked for his leadership. So as a board member, and we were a board of a, of a critical partner, uh, we needed to be prepared for supervised consumption services in London. So our strategy as a board was to be as informed as possible and have generative discussions on the governance issues that we needed to address. So what we did, we invited Dr. Mackey to make a presentation to our board uh, to provide information on the health crisis affecting our community and to reinforce what our centre was already experiencing in uh, primary care. Since Scott, was uh, our ED, was a member of the planning committee, we requested regular updates on the progress of supervised consumption. It was important for the board to have uh, understanding of the dynamics of the process and understand what our role was in advocacy. The board also received a staff presentation on harm reduction to ensure we were all aligned in our understanding of harm reduction principles. The board requested a harm reduction position for the health center as well. A working group was created and the group presented the report to the board for further discussion. The board and staff met with Arlen to discuss supervised consumption along with uh, many other community health issues, so being proactive. 
So the success of these strategic governance opportunities uh, relies on a cohesive and engaged board. Our health center board is diverse in its thinking and backgrounds. We have robust discussions because we challenge each other to stretch our comfort zones. We are fortunate to have on our board a former physician from Nigeria who currently works in health promotion, a newcomer from India, an assistant crown attorney. We have a crown on our board. The health unit uh, chief nursing officer, a Western University professor with an extensive research portfolio on violence against women and children, an educator on gender and sexuality with a strong vo voice in the LGBTQ community, an accountant whose mother used to work at the center as an art therapist in the 90s, and a business manager of an engineering firm, and me, the retired cop. So you can imagine the discussions we have at our meetings with those, uh, those diverse backgrounds. But most importantly, we provide a safe space to have open conversations and the level of respect for each other's position is critical for successful outcomes. And our diverse backgrounds also provides opportunities for us to share uh, the information and knowledge and our experience um, about this issue and other health issues in the community, in our workplaces, our social circles, and at community planning meetings. And what we all agree on is that this is a serious health issue and it requires a community response. And planning is critical, as we heard from Frank, it's important to hear from uh, people with lived experience in relation to drug use. These are the people we are helping and, and we need their voice. We've all seen projects developed without full regard for the users. Think of the paved pathways through a green space that have a worn path in the grass beside it uh, because someone didn't think of the people that were actually using the space. So our job as a board is not to decide on where the paths are built, it's to ensure that the process to determine the right path is developed and implemented. In my opinion, the opioid crisis is a health issue and not a criminal justice issue. Yes, the cop is saying that. Our police leaders uh, also recognize that they can't arrest out of this problem. So we need to address and continue to address the social determinants of health, promote harm reduction, prevent trauma, provide trauma and violence informed care, improve health equity and inclusion, and support mental health and addiction treatment. Thank you. Okay, so I'm from Elgin County. And I don't know if anyone here knows where that is. So we're about 20 minutes south of London and we border Lake Erie. So some of you might know us because um, in St. Thomas, we killed Jumbo many years ago. <laughs> Port Stanley's a tourist town and Port Bruce was where the bridge collapsed with the dump truck on it. <laughs> Just to give you that perspective. <laughs> My disclaimer though is I have seven minutes to talk about harm reduction, church, syphilis and politics so hold on <laughs> so as far as urban versus rural which is a word I can't say I don't know if I said it right um, so you could imagine if you were living in a community that actually it took you an hour to cross from end to end it takes me about 30 minutes Andy how long does it take you to get from end to end an hour okay okay takes me I'll say 45 minutes to get from end to end. And there's only, there was only at the time in 2013 one needle exchange program in the community, and that was in the center in St. Thomas. So could you imagine accessing that service, which had limited hours, transportation barriers, and even in St. Thomas there's transportation barriers. We have a bus, and it runs until 7 o'clock, and that's it. So you're accessing a service where people know you, and everybody knows your business because your, no, your neighbors are nosy. And I have an example that I grew up in Port Stanley in my high school years, and people used to call my parents to tell them what I was doing. So my parents always knew what I was doing. So I don't know if you guys have that experience growing up in a small community. So the fear of accessing the services, you're disclosing that you have a drug habit or you use drugs, 
and there's an automatic stigma and judgment when you go to, to access these services. So often people won't go to them or they would go to London or maybe Chatham, Kent to access services elsewhere. But keep in mind the people that do not have transportation to access these services. I must have got on the dancing before I. So this is actually something I'm very proud of from my public health days. So Port Stanley Needle Exchange programs and how it came to be. So we had a bunch of clients that were accessing the services in St. Thomas. And at the time I was the harm reduction lead and the SD SDOH nurse. And we had a pocket of clients that were coming and, and collecting gear for everyone back in Port Stanley. And at the same time, our hepatitis C rates were higher than the provincial average. And we had a pocket of youth that were using and sharing their equipment. And they came in and tested and they asked, they actually asked us, what can you do to help us? And so we actually listened to the, the client and delivered. So it wasn't easy because Port Stanley is about 2,500, I'm thinking 25 to 3,000 people that uh, live there. It's all like fancy shops. There's not really a lot of space to have a needle exchange program. So I actually approached a local church and I asked them if we would be able to use their space. And so I was asked by the, um, the board to present at a board meeting about what harm reduction is and why I think I need a needle exchange program out of their church in Port Stanley. I did present and I think I shocked them to say the least. And they asked me to return the following Sunday for a Sunday service. And I was like, ooh, I don't want to go to a Sunday service, but they wanted me to talk to the congregation and get by in and understand why it was so important. So that following Sunday, I went to church and surprisingly, I didn't burst into flames. <laughs> and I presented, I presented harm reduction and what was going on in Port Stanley, like sleepy little Port Stanley where you go and it's mostly seniors that live there that you think because that's all who can afford to live there. So I think not even two weeks later, I was able to open the needle exchange program and I actually had a stamp of approval from the clients. They thought it would be great um, as long as I didn't preach or have anybody preach for them. And um, I actually out recruited volunteers from the congregation and my oldest volunteer was 92 years old. So she helped with the program. So it was pretty cool. And the numbers of um, syringes that I was giving out and actually getting in return was higher than what we were doing in St. Thomas. I was giving out a thousand syringes um, at each drop-in, so it was pretty cool. And I met some really great people there. <laughs> they also, another ask was that they, they wanted other services there. So for my sexual health background, I offered pregnancy testing, SDI testing and treatment. So that's where the syphilis piece comes into play. So I had a client that I tested and her results came back that she had syphilis and she had transportation barriers and wasn't able to access St. Thomas to get her injections. So I just put it in a bag and took it to the church and we didn't have an exam room. So I'm thinking, how is this poor girl going to get these injections? I don't know if any of you have seen the needle that you get a few needles for a syphilis treatment. And so we thought, where are we going to go? So I took her into the sanctuary and we used a church pew as an exam bed and I treated her syphilis. So <laughs> so I guess my point is you have to look outside the four traditional walls. You can't deliver your care at, you can deliver your care at your community health center, but sometimes you have to go and find your client and make it easier for them to access services. And the other thing I would warn is you have to be prepared for the negative feedback from the community because the article, the newspaper article, when they caught wind that the church was allowing such horrible things to happen, it was unbelievable. But the church stood up for, for me and said it was the Christian thing to do and that they wouldn't back down, they were gonna do it. And it's, <laughs> and also it's not about implementing programs so that I can feel like a hero or anything. It's just about advocating for our vulnerable clients and doing what we need to do. It's our mandate and that's the reason we all have our job that we have. So that's my Port Stanley, I love my Port Stanley story. <laughs> 
So right now in St. Thomas, these are some headlines that we pulled off that's happening. So I'm gonna try to be politically correct. I can see my boss out in the audience and I'm gonna try to be good. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, so in St. Thomas right now, the library in the city are upset that clients are using drugs in their bathrooms. They've locked the doors. They're complaining about improperly discarded sharps. And the only response so far has been locking down um, public bathrooms in the downtown core. So basically we've pushed people onto the street. So they're using in doorways, in alleys, in fast food restaurants but they're not willing to take on like a community sharps kiosk. Like they're not willing to place the kiosk throughout the city to um, accept the, um, the needles. So there's been a huge debate at city about cost and no one wanting to really pay for it. They want, they want somebody to solve the problem, but they don't want to be part of the solution. And meanwhile, we did have a, a small child that was actually stuck by a needle in the northern part of the city. So it's happening, and our Parks and Recs people are saying that when they're cleaning the flower beds, the flower pots they're finding used here in the, in the downtown area and throughout St. Thomas. The only bylaw there, or anything that's happened from this, and I laugh at this because they have a new bylaw that if you find a syringe in the garbage or beside the garbage, they just won't pick it up. That's their new bylaw. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no, good job. So <laughs> I, th I think I'm going to cover your ears, Judith. I'm actually going to place some syringes by the city hall's garbage and see if they'll pick up their own garbage. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I also co-chair the Elgin Situation Table. So two years ago, we started a table. I don't know if anyone knows what a situation table is, but you talk about acutely elevated risk in the community and the community members come together with a plan and you implement like an intervention within 24 to 48 hours. So basically, um, since I've been at that table, we had a discussion about a drug strategy and the need for one for our county because right now we currently do not have a drug strategy. I don't know if there's anyone else, else out here without a drug strategy for their community. Couldn't really get any buy-in. Nobody really wants to do the work or take the initiative. So after two years of hearing me, oops, I need to use the door, sorry. Hear me bitch about the not having a drug strategy. People are starting to say, hey, yeah, we really need one because most of the situations we have involve drugs. So it's been frustrating and it's taken time to trust one another at the table, but I'm continuing to be persistent. I also belong, I just have to have water because when I'm nervous, I have a dry mouth. There's an opioid monitoring group that's led by public health. And there was a huge debate at the table. And I'm sure Judith remembers the day I came back from this meeting because I was very upset. And public health said it wasn't their mandate to, um, or their priority to be the lead for a drug strategy, a comprehensive drug strategy. They also said we did not have enough overdoses in our county to warrant a supervised injection site. And just pause for that statement alone I, is unacceptable to me. Luckily, there was a couple of my peers from the situation table sitting there and then they turned to me and said, do you wanna tell them, Jackie? And I just told them what I thought. I may have dropped an F-bomb or two, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but after my passionate plea and stress of importance of what we need to do for our clients and our community, I now have public health on board to help me with a drug strategy. And I have some people that are willing to help me fill out my supervised consumption site application. <laughs> so with Central Community Health Center's support, I've taken the lead to, um, for the first steps for a drug strategy, and I'm actually having brainstorming sessions on June 27th, so I'm just gonna do it myself. And we don't have funding for that. So don't always think that money is what's gonna keep you from doing something, keep going ahead. I'm getting the 10 second sign, but 
I want to just share one personal story, and I didn't think I'd share this. And Heather's probably like, oh, Jackie, don't share it. <laughs> it. And I might cry, so I apologize. So I met a gentleman at the Port Stanley Needle Exchange Program. He was a client, and we became very close over the two or three years that I was there. Uh, when I left public health and went to the community health center, we lost touch maybe for about a year or so. And, we re and I saw him in the waiting room one day and we reconnected. And he came to me one day and he, he had his phone with him and we're in the exam room and we're standing arm to arm and he's standing there showing me a video of his daughter and he's narrating and the picture of his, of his daughter in the ICU hooked up to life support. She had an overdose. And he was talking about how drugs were dangerous and you know something needs to be done. And he was sobbing. And I've, I've only heard that a few times working in the emergency room when, of course, when somebody's lost a child, how painful that could be. And I, I thought I was, I was gonna lose it. Like it just, it, it was unbelievably painful. I've never experienced something so emotional. And he said to me, they need to do something. And I said, who? And he said, the government. And then he went like this and he said, me and you, we need to do something. People are dying. Two weeks later, he died. Sorry. So be the change. Don't be afraid to speak up. You might ruffle feathers, but everyone needs to advocate for our clients and drive change. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks to the to the panelists for that. There, um, you know, Jackie, thanks for that that story at at, at the end as well, because these are these, this is a story that's been told uh, 1,200 different times here in Ontario last year, and since and 800 uh, times the year before that. So we have to we have to remember that this is these are not numbers; these are people that this is happening to, and that these people have networks and families, and the impact of this is is huge. And so. Uh, you know, we need to continue to uh, to humanize this in the way that uh, that uh, Frank has done and the way that, that Jackie has done with this. We now have an opportunity for you to ask us questions as well. I uh, ask that you do go to the mic so everybody can hear, or so we can hear your questions. Uh, so uh, just make your way there if you've got anything. Um, but I'm, I'm just, um, I'm curious, I'm cu Jackie, I'm curious, um, we do have members here quite wide range of urban, rural uh, folks here, northern communities. And a lot of us are kind of dealing with this issue of overprescription of opioids and having practices that are created or inherited with these high morphine equivalent doses. How did, you, how did uh, your CHC deal with these issues in, in a kind of a small community like, like St. Thomas? My heart's still pounding from my last picture. Um, in 2015, we had a huge number of intakes uh, of clients that we kind of inherited because we had a number of physicians that retired and we had two or three physicians that passed away and a lot of them were on large amounts of controlled substances. Some of them were even on lethal amounts. So we were kind of, and also at the same time we went through, like I'm sure everyone goes through, we had a lot of physicians that left and we were left with only a 0.5 physician and three nurse practitioners. So we had to come together as a team and look externally to see who we could pull in to help us with the team. So we, um, we asked addiction services, we had the doctor from the methadone clinic, we had a suboxone rep, um, I'm drawing a total blank of who we called, but we had a huge group of um, service providers that came to help us. So what we did was we pulled a team together internally also with our social workers and our physio, and we talked about um, doing comprehensive pain assessments, we talked about weaning or tapering. 
We talked about referrals for methadone, suboxone, but some clients legitimately needed the prescription. So we always involved the client within that discussion and made sure we were doing what was best for the client and for the provider. I know we did, um, we did piss off a lot of people and they left and some of them came back and some of them, some of them didn't. So the important thing though is though you can't have a cookie cutter approach to how to deal with the over prescribing. So every, every client's gonna be different and I think every agency is gonna be different. But reach out to your peers. Like I know we have a great group of the Southwest Regional Management Group that meets and often we just reach out to one another and ask for advice on something and we try to implement it. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of, uh, of Positions and things that I have heard is that the, they felt that there was a mandate to get people down off these drugs, but uh, but there was a very clear direction from the college not to destabilize people. Right. And because what was happening, of course, is that people were shifting into the unregulated market, and we've seen what the results of, of that is with the uh, increase in overdoses. Um, also, Steve, so glad that you were able to make it. Uh, this is, I don't think this is the first time that Frank has been followed by a cop. It was so uh, refreshing for me to hear you talking about this, given the experience that we had in Ottawa in terms of trying to, to gain some, some of that support from the police. So I'm just wondering, what insights you might have about building some of these uh, partnerships with the, 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 the unusual suspects. I mean, the police is a pretty powerful lobby if we could get them on board. Uh, absolutely, Rob. And um, in the, the London experience, as I said about being proactive, uh, uh, Dr. Mackey requested a, a meeting with the police leader, and I really recommend that as whoever the police leader is in your area, um, make connections with them. And uh, he brought a, a couple of community members, uh, social justice uh, activists, um, not I shouldn't say activists, really promoters, because that's, that's what we needed. And, um, and one of those members then became a, a member of the police services board and was actually the chair. <laughs> so, so the community voices matter and getting out there and, uh, and making those connections with the, with the police. The, the one thing is from legislation is that the uh, Safer Ontario uh, Act was enacted in March of this year, and one of the components is a uh, community safety and well-being plan. It's a requirement of the municipality region um, and has to be uh, developed with the, with the police and community members. So this is an opportunity for community, and it's prescribed that community health and, and community services are at that table. So. Um, making that plan, which is an annual plan, to be reviewed is a real opportunity to, uh, to connect with, with the police because you know they will be at, at that table along with situational tables and, and others. Uh, but the governance role is really an important thing. And I know I, I talked about the 16 years of, of uh, police membership on, uh, on our uh, health center board, uh, but that's important. It, make those connections, make those uh, informed, uh, the allies, I can tell you that police, as being the first responders, they're looking for ways to, um, to partner with, with the community to find other ways of, of responding because the, the police response is not the way to, to, to resolve this. So it is making those connections, being on the, <laughs> being part of the governance, being part of the planning, and, uh, and, and even this, this, uh, this new act uh, allows that and sort of forces that for the community to have that well-being plan. And I think in our, in our experience as well, we have seen a shift in the last six months or so with Ottawa Police Services. I think that there's a recognition now of, of, the, of the crisis that is unfolding. I mean, we've been talking about this for seven years that there was a crisis going on, but I think that when it really hit hard, uh, as, first, as part of the first response network that, that police are beginning to see that, yes, in fact, uh, we do need these other services in place, so, right? Is, no, is there nobody at the mic yet? So feel free to make your way to the mic if well, you have uh, over here. questions. Oh, over here, yes. Um, despite the epidemic and despite the growing problem that we have, the only winner seems to be the pharmaceutical company that is actually fabricating fentanyl and so on and so forth. So what are we doing or how are they being involved in taking accountability and making the changes that we need to see from them to be able to provide the same support to the physicians as the physicians are now trying to 
step away from prescribing narcotics. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question. So again, I mean, we have to be careful about the idea that the goal is to get people not to be taking drugs because we all take drugs and that drugs is a normal part of human experience. We have arbitrarily decided that some drugs are bad and other drugs are good. Uh, but but there's, there's definitely a pharmacy role, and this is a bit of the conflict uh, around uh, doing things like injectable hydromorphone treatments. It's actually uh, taking away from an unregulated market, but you're actually lining the po pockets of a yet another pharmaceutical company. So it feels like a bit of a no-win situation all around. Uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, they, Purdue in particular is, you know, there's attempts to be holding them accountable for the, in, for the, for the, for, for the, crimes that they have committed against, uh, uh, against the in, in creation of this issue. So, uh, yeah, there, it, I don't know, know if I have a good answer to your question, uh, but uh, there's, there's a role for pharmacy in the treatment of opioid use disorder. There's definitely a role for it. Um, but like everything, we really over, um, overcapitalized everything. And so the, the, the profit incentive is, is quite phenomenal in that. So unfortunately, I think we're gonna see a lot more of that, that uh, pharmaceutical company is gonna make a lot of money on this. Creating the problem and then solving the problem. I have a second part to my question. Okay, um, I also understand that the pharmaceutical company who makes fentanyl, I don't know the name, sorry, um, has vowed that their sales rep will no longer be promoting fentanyl. Um, how has that impacted the change that we're trying to create? Because I know that was very publicly announced and it was in the media for quite a bit. Okay, uh, any, 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 any attempt to withdraw uh, pharmaceutical supply of regulated drugs from the market is going to increase harm. It's, it's a, um, I, th I think about it like a labyrinth, right? Like, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive in some ways. Like, isn't this how we got into the problem in the first place? But we got to recognize that we have to treat people who are dependent on these drugs. We have to treat that situation differently from people who are new starts. And we don't want to have new people become dependent on these drugs and go down, go down this pathway uh, to, uh, to, towards increasing harm. But people who are already there, we, we can't cut them off from the supply. So we have to treat that population very differently. So anything that talks about uh, limiting access to regulated drugs is just another form of prohibition, and, and it's going to cause harm. Uh, I want to uh, thank you very much, Rob, Frank, uh, Jackie, and Steve, and, and uh, I can also say I never thought I'd have a, a police officer on my board of directors, let alone ask for one to be replaced and repeated, so <laughs> I understand sort of the, the piece with, with police officers on boards, but we appreciate your insights and your contributions on this um, important topic, so thank you very much.